So first off, we have Ken Allende. Um, he was a PhD student at Brighton University specialising in black identity. He also has um, an article in the current International Socialism Journal, um, and it, the article is called uh, Marx and Race, a Eurocentric Analysis, so very relevant to this particular meeting. And he's also written the opening chapter to this book, Say It Loud, about the roots of racism. So without further ado, Ken. Uh, right, uh, so this um, talk will be based very heavily on the piece in the ISJ, only there's a lot more in the piece on the ISJ, so I do recommend that people read it if they, if, um, if they haven't um, as um, yet. What I want to start from, really, is the point that there's been um, a new movement um, about decolonising universities, which is, there's another session on at the moment, so I'm not really going to talk about it, but one of the things that I think is interesting is that in a movement that is starting to talk about how important it is to get... Um, to stop just talking about white European men uh, running uh, things and coming up with ideas and the suggestion that all progressive or ideas that have taken societies forward have come from such people, uh, there has been a kind of uh, an element of people saying, and that includes uh, the likes of uh, Marx and Engels and Marxism in, in general. Um, and I want to slightly challenge this idea um, that Marxism is in itself Eurocentric um, and Orientalist. Now, we'll come, come back on these terms uh, briefly. Uh, firstly, Orientalism, which is often the, the term most often used, was something that was used by um, Edward Said in an important book called Orientalism uh, that came out in 1978. Um, it wasn't mostly an attack on Marxism. It was mostly an attack on the way that Western thought tends to other um, other societies. What I mean by that is that it takes the West Western ideas, and that is European ideas as the norm, and then says that apart from this, you have places that are outside Europe and they're wrong and often can't develop without intervention from Europe. Uh, these, these are two things that, uh, that become um, import, important. The term Eurocentrism um, was um, originally coined um, by Samir Amin, an uh, Egyptian uh, Marxist theoretician, um, and he was talking about similar things, which is the idea of seeing Europe as being at the center of every, um, every kind of, uh, uh, of political and, and social development. Um, I will also mention, if I hope I have time to, uh, some more um, some related arguments, uh, such as arguments about um, why black people moved uh, away from Marxism, which were uh, which were brought up by the um, uh, theoretician uh, Cedric Robinson. Um, but what I want to uh, to start with is talking about um, whether Marx, uh, in his um, thinking, was uh, was Eurocentric. And one thing that um, I think is quite important about this because the, the arguments are coming up about um, enlightenment thought, and that's the thought that often came out of the 18th century, the early period of um, capitalism being uh, Eurocentric, and often people saying, and Marx was very much of this tradition, and I'm surprised by the number of people who are saying this often in, uh, in new texts who appear not to have read any Marx, who appear not to have actually engaged with the arguments that, uh, that are being put forward, and often will be, have just engaged with a few passages uh, which were put forward in Edward Said's book, um, Orientalism, um, and, uh, and in a couple of other places. So I did want to start by looking at that. Uh, by looking at the way uh, what Said was saying uh, was wrong with this way of thinking, which is saying that effectively people outside Europe have no agency, uh, that what you have to want, if you want to look for ad advancement, you're expecting people uh, to come uh, with ideas from Europe. And firstly to say that um, in uh, Samir Amin's book, he makes it very clear, and I think he's right to do this, that this is something, this idea emerged with capitalism. It's something that emerges in the um, 18th and 19th century. And there's a logical reason for this, which is if you go back to what we look back from here as the Middle Ages, or really the period um, up to the, the rise of capitalism, if you look um, from that period across from Europe to uh, North Africa, to the Islamic civilizations, or further uh, across to India or to China, the idea that you could say that these civilizations were inherently inferior to what was going on in Europe was so ludicrous 
that um, people, it didn't occur to people to say such a thing. Now, they might have said that these places were morally wrong or not good in various places, but actually, technically, they tended to be more advanced. Um, it's only with the development of capitalism that you start seeing uh, the European um, states starting to move ahead um, economically and uh, have the ability to dominate the, the whole of the world. Um, with that, you start getting ideas that come up where people are saying, well, actually, this is because of something inherently uh, um, superior about European people. Uh, sometimes people say this goes back to um, just a, a racial thing. Sometimes they say it goes back to ideas that came from uh, Greek civilization. Sometimes it's put in terms of uh, Protestantism and the Protestant work ethic. Um, but whatever it is, you start seeing the idea that says that really it's only Europe that can develop um, develop ideas. And this is what becomes the popular idea uh, ideas that come out of the Enlightenment. And it's um, people might want to come back in this in discussion, but it's at this point, I think, that you start seeing the real development of racism. People sometimes talk about racism as something that is a hangover from an earlier period. But I think it's interesting that it develops scientifically, well, not scientifically, but starts being seen as a scientific idea um, around this time. Now, Marx emerged from uh, the uh, the people who were trying to understand this new world that, um, that had developed. And he was influenced by um, a lot of uh, thinkers from the uh, Enlightenment, um, notably Hegel. Um, but what Marx's specific thing he was trying to do was look at the development of capitalism. And I'm going to quite be quite casual about talking about Marx and Engels, because often they were talk, working together, but it's um, difficult to remember exactly which, uh, which time they were talking together and were, were writing separately. So I might be a bit uh, casual, over casual about that. But the, um, the point I want to make is that when Marx was looking at saying, how did capitalism develop? How did it become uh, the dominant system? Capitalism at the point in the early 19th century when he started writing was almost exclusively existent in Britain and uh, parts of Europe and small parts of America. So to say that he started by examining societies uh, that were based in Britain uh, and uh, Europe is not surprising. And as uh, I think uh, Samir Amin rightly says, that doesn't make him a Eurocentric thinker because he's looking at Europe where capitalism uh, capitalism was developing. Um, however, when um, Samir Amin uh, does um, attack what Marx is saying, he's looking at something slightly different, uh, which is when Marx wrote in 1853 a series of articles on um, the situation in India and the British dominance over India, he did say at one point, now, uh, he was attacking uh, the brutality of the British invasion um, and the destruction of uh, local communities. And a quote, he says, we must not forget that these idyllic uh, village communities, inoffensive though they may appear, had always been the solid foundation of Oriental despotism, which I shall come back to, um, and that they restrained uh, the human mind within the smallest possible compass. Uh, depriving it of all grandeur and historical energies. Um, England, it is true, in causing a social revolution in Hindustan, which means India, uh, was act actuated only by the vilest interests. But that is not the question. The question is, can mankind fulfil its destiny without fundamental revolution in the social state of Asia? Um, if not, whatever may have been the crimes of England, she was the unconscious tool of history in bringing about that revolution. So what he's saying in this passage is that if uh, India is static and needs kick-starting in order to have a, the class struggle which will lead to revolution and lead to uh, human history uh, advancing, if the British invasion has achieved that, then um, it has helped in, in, putting, uh, in putting history forward. Now, Said argues that whether Marx... Um, while Marx was definitely much more sympathetic to um, Indian people and oppressed people than others were, uh, the fact that he said this uh, shows that he was basically part of the same project of saying you need uh, Europe to, um, uh, to, to be involved in, uh, in any change in what's happening elsewhere. Now, I want to make a couple of quick comments on this. Firstly, I think there's a slight difference in what Marx is saying from what most of the um, imperialist and enlightenment thinkers were saying, which was that the, uh, the coming of um, Europeans into uh, India, in this case, would provide, um, take forward civilization. 
what he was saying was that it would break a log jam which would allow Indians to develop and take forward civilization, which isn't quite the same thing. Um, I do think that there was an element, though, at this point, which is quite early in his career, where Marx um, did accept that you needed this kick from outside. And he said precisely about building uh, things like railways. So he said in the same year, 1853, you cannot maintain a network of railways over an immense country without introducing all those industrial processes necessary to meet uh, the immediate and current wants of railway locomotion. So that you need all the industry that goes around um, running uh, ra railways. So that this technical advance would create a working class in India who would then uh, be able to, uh, to overthrow um, the capitalist system. One of the things that he found fairly rapidly was that this wasn't really how things were working, uh, that actually um, imperial control over uh, countries like India actually held things back. So it didn't create uh, the, this kind of advance in the way that, uh, that Marx had already uh, talked about. And he starts looking fairly rapidly at seeing how important it is that you have anti-imperialist struggles. Now, I would like to talk about this in more depth, but I don't really have a lot of time. But it does mean that where Edward Said talks about what Marx is doing, he relies very much on four articles that Marx wrote in um, 1853. By the great Indian uprising of 1857, Marx already shifted his position. He was saying something uh, fairly different. He was saying that actually um, India... Indians rising up was part of what would change. So you're not getting a situation where you see capitalism developing through Europe coming in and therefore, um, and then people having to rise up against that. It was part of the way capitalism develops will be shaped by people rising up against it and you have to support the people who are, who are rising up against it. Uh, so in 1857, he said at one point, India is now our best ally. He was talking about this as being something about um, of overthrowing um, the system. Now he talked by this time about anti-colonial struggles as being important, uh, particularly in Ireland, which I'm not going to mention, I think um, Lucia is going to talk more about. Uh, that side of things. Uh, but I do want to mention things to do directly with race and how he was looking particularly at um, what was happening in the United States, the arguments around uh, the, the Civil War and, and slavery there. Um, because again, one of the arguments that's come up quite a lot recently is to say that Marx saw um, racism and slavery is incidental to the development of capitalism. I think it's very hard to read much Marx and <coughs> keep this idea because he says again and again that he saw the development of slavery as absolutely central to the development of capitalism and not just as something that went before in the way that feudalism might do but also as something that was inherent in the way that the capitalist system developed um, right up not just through the, the slave trade but also through providing raw materials that were then um, integrated into into setting up the, uh, the early, early industry in Britain, the cotton trade and so on. Um, and he goes um, on about this at some level and he sees the American Civil War and the ending of um, slavery in America as, as absolutely central. Um, I'm mean, just quoting again the one thing he said, the veiled slavery of wage workers in Europe needed for its pedestal, slavery pure and simple in the new world. Um, so his ideas on this change, and I think that they change in a way that Said doesn't take into account. Uh, and I think that's one reason why people who want to understand the issues of what Marx was saying need to look at some of Marx's arguments and the um, arguments put forward by, uh, by Marx's heirs. Um, also, the other, other point that Said made was about uh, the, the use of the term um, oriental despotism. Now, Marx had it in his mind at the, in this early period that these were very static societies. And I think he was wrong about this. Um, and one of the things that you see, uh, and he... So he was talking about how do we break out from the feeling uh, that these are static societies where nothing has changed uh, for millennia. Now, it simply wasn't true that nothing had changed in these societies for millennia. Um, and one of the things you see as Marx develops into his mature uh, period, capital and after, is that he starts being much more interested in societies outside Europe. Uh, and one of the reasons that he one of many reasons why he doesn't get around to actually finishing capital is because he starts looking at different ways that you can um, see um, how societies have developed. And he starts looking to anthropology and trying to see non-capitalist uh, non societies. What he originally talked about as this oriental despotism, which he sometimes talks about as the um, 
Asiatic mode of production ceases being something which is outside over there um, and becomes uh, a different way of, 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 of organizing. I, I haven't realized I'm running out of time, so I don't really want you to, to, to talk about this in depth, but he stops seeing it as a thing that's static, that's in a way that people in Asia organize and start seeing it much more as something uh, that's related to um, different types of society and societies which he's, he's not all de developing as they developed uh, in Europe. Uh, and in fact, when some Russian socialists who are looking at uh, ways of uh, political organization um, in Russia start um, talking about what's uh, what's happening, they actually write to Marx and say, are you saying that all societies have to develop as they did in uh, in Europe? And he writes back and says, well, specifically, no, I was writing about Europe because that's what I knew about. Okay, um, and um, he goes on to say that, um, um, I've now lost my place entirely, uh, but yes, he does um, a, a, a preface to the, uh, Russian edition of the Communist Manifesto in 1882, where he writes, um, can the Russian of I can't pronounce that, the present com peasant commune pass directly into the higher communist form of communal ownership? Or must it first go through the same process uh, which marks the West's historical development? If the Russian Revolution becomes a signal for proletarian revolution in the West, um, then Russia's peasant communal land ownership may serve as the point of departure for a communist development. What he's saying is it doesn't have to go through all the, all the same stages if you have uh, uh, an international uh, revolution. So the point I would say is that in both cases, uh, the way Said argues suggests a lack of development in Marx. You see an enormous development in Marx and indeed a richness in a lot of what he said, uh, which is often left out um, by later scholars who would regard themselves as Marxists. Um, this is, I've uh, now not really got enough time to talk uh, about what I was hoping to say about um, Cedric Robinson and black Marxism, which is an argument about how uh, black radicalism developed and how the relationship between idea, uh, uh, Marxist ideas developed. And I think that there's, I would want to say that one of the important things about this is precisely how Marxism was seen, uh, what I would call Stalinism, as a, a state ideology for um, the development of a new class system in um, the Soviet Union. And what actually happened was it meant that you saw a real change round in the way that these ideas were looked at. Um, so that ideas that Marx was coming up, uh, was coming up with, which were very uh, flexible and looked um, at different places and different kinds of societies, was mentioned in the previous session, um, very openly started becoming much more rigid, rigid um, and nationalist. And you start seeing a closing down of ways of looking at these ideas and a closing down of different um, attitudes. And one thing it would say is it's fascinating, this is one thing that Robinson's book is quite interesting on, is the history of why it was that many, many uh, black activists looked to the Soviet Union. Um, I do want to get in uh, a quotation on the death of Lenin uh, from um, Marcus Garvey, uh, who said in 1924, uh, the Russian Revolution took out of the hands of the privileged class the destiny of Russia's government. Uh, for over five years, Lenin and Trotsky were able to hold the Russian peasantry together and establish for the first time in modern days a government wherein the people ruled. Russia promised great hope not only for Negroes, but for the weaker people of the world. Um, now, Garvey was in no way a Marxist or a real supporter of um, what was happening in uh, Russia and so on, but he saw this as a place that was deeply attractive to lots of black people, people in the colonial and colonized world, um, as a means of liberation and therefore one that had to be related to. This is a tradition which is often left out by people who are say that uh, Marxism um, is Eurocentric and that Marx, uh, Marx's ideas were Eurocentric, which is why I think it's so important to defend those ideas um, and to go on defending them up to saying that it's not even the case that all the um, black activists who joined the Communist Party, who looked to Marxist ideas, whether it was uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, whether it was C.L.R. James, um, or a number of, of other people through history, all rejected those ideas, as, uh, as comes across in some of what, um, what Robinson writes. Because, 
accepting that um, means accepting that there is um, a fundamental break. And I think that this is something that you see, uh, it's something that you see in a lot of um, <coughs> black nationalist arguments. It's certainly something that you see um, in current arguments in part of the, the resurgence of our, our interest in in this history um, in a book by um, Back to Black, for instance, by Kahindi Andrews, which has been quite popular recently, which in its arguments about the history of Marxism and anti-racism basically doesn't engage with the history of Marxism and anti-racism. What it talks about um, is some of the critiques, I mean, I, I don't know Kahindi Andrews, but I would get the impression that he's read Cedric Robinson, but not any Marx, because that's the, he doesn't actually engage with any of Marx's arguments, and when he does try to engage with them, he tends to get them wrong. Um, I think that often people accept these arguments um, because they haven't actually come across the tradition of Marxism, which was based very much on challenging racism at all times, on challenging Eurocentrism, and this is why uh, Marx was uh, such an inspiration to uh, black activists in America, to anti-colonial activists around the world, and I think that this is a tradition uh, that we need to, to come back to, and I hope that this, is, uh, that this is something that people will be encouraged to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, that was brilliant. So, coming up next, we have uh, Lucia Cordella, who is a lecturer at King's College London in International Political Economy. Um, she has a book that's already out. The book, oh, yes. yeah, part of books, yeah. Polarising Development and Globalisation and Critique of Political Economy. And she'll be speaking for another 20 minutes or so. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Today, um, I want to um, address the question of uh, Marxist Eurocentrism or his critique of Eurocentrism, starting from uh, his considerations on Ireland. And uh, I also want to discuss what, uh, in my view, uh, we can draw today uh, from, from his writings on Ireland uh, and what kind of lessons we can draw. Well, I, I focus on Ireland because Ireland was the first uh, British colony and also because of its uh, geographical proximity, the British ruled over Ireland with the unprecedented violence. And uh, so for many scholars, Marx's writings on Ireland and his analysis of uh, Irish development is actually a model for understanding uh, dependent development in the periphery. And um, I have worked also on Marx's writings uh, on colonialism, for example, on India, uh, China, uh, the United States, and the Civil War in, in America. And uh, I believe that that's uh, the case, so that really Ireland can be a model for uh, an analysis of dependent capitalism. But I just want to focus on Ireland because it's here, in my view, that the link between imperialism, migration, and uh, racism appears more uh, uh, clearly in uh, Marx's uh, um, writings. And um, these, uh, these questions, so this link between imperialism, racism, and migration, was also crucial to Marx's activities within the First International, and uh, also the development of these revolutionary and anti-racist politics, which is something I want to discuss with you today. So the first point I want to make is that, contrary to what is usually believed, in, in Capital Marx is not analyzing England or English capitalism as a, a national economy, self-enclosed national economy, but uh, he's also including Ireland in this case, and I believe more generally the colonies, as part of the English capitalist system. And so uh, in Capital, Marx defines Ireland as an agricultural district of England, which happens to be divided by a wide stretch of water from the country to which it provides corn, wool, cattle, industrial and military recruits. Um, in his writings, uh, Marx shows how, and also in Capital, he shows how the annexation of uh, Ireland and its colonization um, led to the ruin of the internal market for Irish uh, manufacturing production, forcing Ireland to specialize in uh, agricultural production. Now, for a long time, uh, this um, took place, this specialization 
uh, in agricultural production was somehow um, protected by the system of the corn laws. And so uh, Ireland was producing all sorts of uh, primary commodities like uh, potatoes, which were also the main uh, kind of uh, element of the diet of the English uh, uh, working class. And uh, this um, system, agricultural system, Marx and Engels analyze again and again how it was based on a kind of very exploitative uh, system of uh, tenant farming that impoverished the farmers systematically and pushed them to emigrate, leading to the growth of Dublin, which was in the 19th century, the only city of slums uh, in uh, Western Europe. And this uh, uh, system and the extensive exploitation of the land without really any sort of uh, capitalist uh, agricultural technique also led to the uh, exploitation of the soil, creating uh, the ground for famines. Like, for example, the 1845 famine that, as you know, um, many of you already know probably led to the death of about 1.5 million people and forced another million people to emigrate out of a population of 8 million. And um, it's important here that for Marx, uh, the famine in Ireland, the Great Famine, wasn't a natural catastrophe, but was actually the product of British capital, of British colonialism, and was caused by uh, British rule on Ireland and by the systematic exploitation of the soil it was based upon. And, uh, uh, and so here we see how, for Marx, there is a connection between uh, human exploitation and also environmental exploitation. So this uh, as part of the uh, <laughs> part and parcel of the colonial system. And also Marx uh, looks at the consequences of the famine and shows that actually it was exploited by English landlord, landlords and parliament to impose an agricultural revolution that didn't have much of a kind of revolution in terms of improving the means of production, but actually led to the replacement of the population with the cattle, pigs, and the sheep. And this led to a systematic uh, um, expulsion of the natives. And Marx says, so the result is the gradual expulsion of the natives and the gradual deterioration and exhaustion of natural life, the soil. So uh, we see here really this ecological dimension in uh, Marx's writings. And uh, um, he also highlights how this kind of exploitation, systematic exploitation of Ireland, couldn't be imposed without systematic recourse to violence and to, through, uh, without uh, really imposing a reign of terror in the country to uh, crush opposition among uh, the population. But it's also important to bear in mind, this is something Marx writes in the uh, 70s, 1870s, that every nation that oppresses another is only forging chains uh, for itself. And so, as I said at the beginning, uh, Marx didn't see Ireland as a kind of uh, foreign country, but was really part, yeah, it was a district uh, of England. And so the kind of surplus population, what today is uh, defined as a kind of surplus population of Ireland, both this kind of uh, small peasants, impoverished peasants, and those who actually migrated to Dublin uh, in particular, were not like uh, external to the actual population of Britain, but they were part of the industrial reserve army that actually English capital could use on the one side uh, to lower the prices of uh, primary commodities and food, for example, the potatoes, on the other side, um, through immigration, of course, uh, Ireland guaranteed a constant supply of labor power for uh, English industrial capitalism. And that's why, for example, Engels says, well, without this uh, uh, reserve army of labor, we couldn't even uh, think of uh, English industry, English industrialization couldn't have taken place without its ability to rely upon this uh, surplus, uh, relative surplus population. And so they um, again and again uh, analyze how immigrant workers in uh, England were the worst paid of the industrial proletariat. They worked for salaries below the physical minimum, 
and lived in appalling conditions akin to the non-qualified English workers. And uh, they also highlighted how the human degradation of the Irish um, actually allowed capital to drive down the conditions of the working class as a whole. So we see here that uh, for Marx and for Angus, the exploitation and the oppression of Ireland and of immigrant workers in um, England affects the condition of the entire uh, working class uh, in, in England. And uh, um, another point that uh, he highlights is that the ruling classes in uh, England use this uh, situation and the downward competition that the Irish um, um, exercised against their own will to foment feelings of fear, uh, hatred and racism uh, amongst uh, English uh, workers. And he also shows uh, that uh, in turn, Irish workers saw in the, in the English workers the complicit supporters of a British uh, domination over Ireland. And so there was uh, really a kind of antagonism developing between English workers and the uh, Irish workers in England. And what Marx says is that this antagonism is the secret of the imp impotence of the working class in England, despite its uh, organization. And it's also the secret of the maintenance of power by the capitalist class and the latter is quite aware of this. So uh, the, the ruling classes in, uh, in England are quite aware that racism is really key to the maintenance of uh, their own power. And that's why they use the uh, racism in uh, such a systematic way. But it's also important to highlight that for Marx, immigration wasn't a negative process uh, at all. So he didn't have a negative view of immigration or thought it was something we should kind of uh, oppose in any way. So for, for Marx, immigration, Im immigration and immigration was actually a systematic process that resulted from uh, uh, agricultural relations as they were developing in Ireland. So it was uh, systematic. There wasn't anything you could do uh, to oppose immigration if you didn't oppose the entire system that uh, it resulted from. And he also saw the emancipatory potential of uh, international migration, especially in the context of uh, rising anti-imperialist struggles in, uh, in Ireland in the, in the 60s and the Fenian movement. He uh, realized that uh, Irish workers were bringing their own aspirations and uh, yes, their own aspirations in, into uh, the labor movement in uh, England. And so they were pushing uh, workers in India, in England to address uh, systematic issues of colonization and dispossession, for example. And also they were pushing them uh, to support their national liberation struggle. So uh, what Marx believed is that actually the racist divisions that uh, the ruling classes were fomenting among the working class didn't have any social value for the workers who in their struggle could actually overcome racism and transform uh, competition into uh, solidarity. And uh, what we saw is that actually from the very beginning of the first international, the international had links uh, to the Fenian movement, even though this movement was criminalized by the British state. And so these links were not uh, uh, public. And um, over the years, um, first divisions emerged between Marx and uh, the English uh, trade union leaders, who uh, had been, uh, some of whom had been quite outspoken in the uh, struggle against slavery during uh, the American Civil War. But now they were backtracking on uh, Ireland also because of the violent methods used by the Fenians. And so uh, I just was reading uh, Kevin Anderson again, and I thought this passage was very interesting because he says, well, evidently it was easier for these trade unionists uh, to oppose slavery across the Atlantic than to take a stance closer to home in Ireland. This was the beginning of a division that would create a split between Marx and English trade union leaders in 1871 during the Paris Commune. So uh, we see here how the Irish question had 
was politically central, yes, also in the kind of future developments of the relationship between uh, Marx and the English trade union movement. And uh, Marx became more and more aware of the centrality of uh, this question. And uh, well, it's quite well known that at the end of 1869, he came to the conclusion that uh, actually it wasn't uh, the liberation or kind of the working class movement in uh, England that would have led to the liberation of Ireland, but vice versa, uh, Irish emancipation would uh, be the kind of basis for the emancipation of the working class in, in, in England. So he says it is in the absolute um, interest of the English working class to get rid of their present connection with Ireland. I'm fully convinced of this for reasons that in part I cannot tell the English workers themselves. For a long time, I believed that it would be possible to overthrow the Irish regime by English working class ascendancy. Deeper study has now convinced me of the opposite. The English working class will never accomplish anything because it has got rid of Ireland. Before it has got rid of Ireland, the lever uh, must be applied in Ireland. So <clears throat> I, I just want to uh, conclude my talk by reflecting on the kind of relevance of this kind of change of mind and just trying to uh, think with you uh, about the meaning of this, because I think it's, a, it's quite a radical change of mind, really, on Marx's part. Well, the first thing that um, uh, I want to uh, think about, my first point, is that, of course, in order to understand immigrant, anti-immigrant racism, we uh, need to look both at the kind of systemic processes of uh, dispossession and um, exploitation uh, that underpin, uh, uh, underpin this system, but we also need to look at the new possibilities of working class internationalism that uh, uh, are generated by this process itself. Also, I think that um, Marx's analysis of Ireland had, uh, had shed line on contemporary border imperialism. So on the one side, we have Western imperialism creating the conditions for international migration, uh, for the rise of number of people displaced, of refugees internationally. And on the other side, we have a securitization of borders that uh, basically um, try to um, keep out, apparently, or criminalize immigrants, the same immigrants that uh, they displace, uh, criminalizing them and rationally discriminating against them in order to increase uh, their exploitation. So um, I think that um, looking at this uh, uh, systemic dimension of contemporary racism, also forces us to adopt a different approach to uh, anti-racism pro-immigrant uh, work because I, do, I think it's not enough to say let's uh, let them in or let's open the borders. So we also need to look at the kind of uh, broader context of uh, imperialist domination and also, for example, today at um, what this implies in terms of uh, border militarizations in, in the Mediterranean and in Africa, the uh, externalization of European border policies and border controls to uh, African countries, the growth of detention centers, uh, forced labor violence that is basically generated by our, our policies. So we need to look at the effects of uh, restrictive immigration policies, both in Europe and uh, uh, abroad. Uh, the other point that um, I think it's important to highlight is that the uh, violence against immigrants in uh, detention centers, uh, at the borders, through deportations and so on, uh, kind of uh, naturalizes um, um, and kind of their conditions and victimizes them for the um, kind of condition that they are actually subject to 
as a result of, uh, of imperialism and capitalist development, and in this way obscures the responsibility of Western imperialism for appropriating resources in the first place and displacing immigrants. And in this way, by victimizing immigrants for the condition that they face, uh, they actually give the impression that they are really a surplus population, that they are really surplus disposable, uh, and so on. And in, um, and in this way, uh, it's, uh, this, this kind of violence shifts uh, uh, the responsibility away from uh, uh, social power relations. And I think that this kind of mechanism is actually crucial to understanding contemporary processes of racialization because um, in this way, so we have the construction of essentialist uh, markings based on ra racial, religious, or national characteristics that uh, depict colonized people and oppress people as a different kind of humanity and in this way help create divisions among workers uh, making their um, organization uh, more, more difficult. So, um, just, just to conclude, I think that when we think about the kind of political conclusions we want to draw from this, uh, I think we should take uh, Marx's change of mind quite seriously. Because, uh, as we said, if we pre previously believed that the uh, revolution in England would have led to the liberation of the colonies, now he came really to uh, the opposite conclusion. And this helps explain why, in the late years of his life, Marx devoted more and more attention to uh, anti-colonial struggles and the kind of resistance that the peoples outside the West uh, were kind of... Um, posing to the development of uh, global capitalism. And he also planned substantially to revise parts of capital in, in the light of these examples. So probably if he managed to do that, a uh, capital today would look uh, quite differently. So I think uh, uh, today, similarly, in order to overcome Eurocentrism, also in our political practice, it's important to uh, grasp the centrality of uh, not, not only uh, Western imperialism, but also struggles uh, in the global South and build our anti-racist solidarity uh, in our solidarity towards workers and uh, oppressed people in the global South. They are actually fighting uh, Western imperialism. And I think we have a fantastic, a fantastic examples from Sudan and Algeria and other countries. And I think uh, this really uh, shows us the way forward and gives uh, us hope, I think. And uh, when we need a lot of hope also. Thank you. Uh, <laughs>